Hello, everyone, and welcome to our International Higher Education, the Big Picture Author Webinar. My name is Patty Webb, and I'm the Marketing Manager for Stylus Publishing. Stylus webinars bring you direct access to our authors and their latest titles. Today, I'm happy to introduce Darla Deerdorf, Hans DeWitt, Betty Lisk, and Harvey Charles, editors of the Handbook of International, Inter International Higher Education, Second Edition. This book came out in December with Stylus and is co-published with AIEA, the Association of International Education Administrators. AIEA is also our co-host for this webinar series. So thank you and welcome to all of our AEI members joining us today. So without further ado, please welcome our moderator for today's webinar, AIEA Executive Director, Darla Deerdorf. Thank you so much, Patty, and thanks so much to all of you for being here today with us. We are so, so excited to, to launch this new second edition of the Handbook on International Higher Education. And we wish to express appreciation to Stylus for working with the Association of International Education Administrators, AIEA, in publishing this second edition. AIEA is very pleased to be celebrating its 40th anniversary this year in 2022. So it's very appropriate that we mark that anniversary with this particular publication. And I should mention that the association is pleased to also be hosting an in-person conference next month in New Orleans, and all of you are invited. Um, we're looking forward to our first in-person conference in two years. Our last was in February 2020 in DC. And uh, we will actually be having a, a special session at this conference uh, in New Orleans, featuring some of the handbook contributors there. Uh, and then there will also be a virtual global summit in April. We are also thrilled that this is the first in a series of webinars featuring the contributors from the handbook. And you'll hear more about the other two uh, webinars at the end of, of our time today. And those will be held in March. So as you heard, my name is Darla Deerdorf. I am Executive Director of the Association of International Education Administrators and uh, one of the editors of this handbook. I'm joined today by the other three editors of the second edition. Uh, Hans de Witt is Professor Emeritus and Distinguished Fellow of the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College, Senior Fellow at the International Association of Universities, and founding ed editor of the Journal of Studies in International Education, among a long list of other um, amazing accomplishments. He's also a prolific author and has published many books in this field. Betty Lisk, who will be joining us through a recording, given the time zone differences, uh, is a professor emerita in the Internationalization of Higher Education at La Trobe University in Australia, and is currently Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Studies in International Education, and uh, has really done cutting edge research on the internationalization of the curriculum, including a book uh, by that title as well. Harvey Charles is a Professor of International Education at the University of Albany, SUNY, State University of New York, and has served as a senior international officer at numerous higher education institutions in the US. And he is also a past president of AIEA. Uh, we want to encourage all of you to post questions you might have to any of us in the Q&A function of the webinar uh, here today. And we look forward to our discussion that will follow later in this webinar. So today we would like to provide a brief overview of the handbook and let, let you hear from the editors about some of the emerging trends and themes along with some thoughts on what this means for international education leaders today. So in 1992, AIEA published a groundbreaking book in the field of international higher education called Bridges to the Future. And I actually have a copy of it here. It looks like this. Um, called Bridges to the Future, Strategies for Internationalizing Higher Education that was edited by Charles Classic and all the contributors were from US-based institutions. The publication of this book came at the end of the Cold War and marked a time of dramatic growth in higher education with many changes within the international education field itself. 20 years later, in 2012, AIA decided to publish an update to that seminal 1992 book, this time as a handbook of international higher education. So you can see how much the field changed just in 20 years time um, by 
by the, the two books there. Um, and that particular handbook, the first edition, was edited by an international team of editors on three continents, um, Hans DeWitt, John Heil, Tony Adams, and myself. And this book really marked the move of internationalization from the periphery of higher education to the core, featuring contributions from, from around the world. So really becoming more global um, in, 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 its, in its outlook. The international education field has continued to evolve over the last decade with many new issues, trends, practices, and research emerging during the years. And certainly, certainly much has changed just in the last two years with the pandemic. So we are so pleased then that AIEA decided to update the 2012 handbook with the second edition. And as with the first edition of the handbook, the chapters often pair scholars from different places in the world, scholars and practitioners, and it includes text box contributions from colleagues all over the world that highlight institutional, national, and concrete experiences and examples of international higher education. Many of the chapters are updated, and there are also some new additions to the original handbook. The second edition maintains the structure of the first edition comprising four sections, with the first section addressing national, regional, and international frameworks and contexts. The second section presents key aspects of internationalization at the strategy level, such as assessment, financing, and risk management. The third section describes core functions of internationalization, including updated chapters on intercultural competence and new chapters on topics like virtual exchange. And the last section looks at transnational activities, including international joint universities. Um, and I just wanna emphasize that it's so important to see that international higher education is so much more than simply mobility of moving students around the world and, and this chapter, the sections in, um, this last section certainly addresses that. The concluding chapter brings in new voices, and we're so excited about that, and examines emerging themes within the field, which Hans will be speaking about now. So at this point, I'd like to, to turn this over to Hans, who will speak about some of the emerging uh, themes, then we'll hear from Betty, and then we'll hear uh, thoughts from, from, from Harvey before we come back to all of you with questions that you might have. So over to you, Hans. All right, Hans, I think you might need to unmute. Sorry, classical mistake. We still do that after two years of being in full time in Zoom. Uh, thank you, Darla, and thank you, Patricia, for uh, the introduction, and uh, thank you for being part of this uh, really second edition of the handbook. Uh, as Dana said, I was also part of the first edition and uh, it's quite fascinating to see how uh, the field has in 10 years expanded uh, even much more than in the 20 years between the 1992 Bridges of the Future and the first edition of the handbook, uh, uh, which gives an illustration about how important the uh, internationalization higher education is uh, in these days uh, and of course uh, and we can come back to that maybe later in discussion uh, as Dara said this was a handbook that was developed uh, already start before the, the pandemic and uh, in the first year of the pandemic uh, of course there might be even much bigger changes in the coming 10 years of a result of not only that but for other reasons uh, I have been involved in the historical chapter of the, the handbook and looking into the development of internationalization of higher education in the historical context. Uh, but it is even more important to look at the future. And so what we wanted to do uh, in our concluding chapter is to look into uh, what has the past and current situation of internationalization higher education meant to what we can expect or should expect even better say for the future of internationalization of higher education. And <clears throat> we decided not to do that only ourselves, but in particular to invite new uh, rising stars uh, from all over the world, um, uh, over 20 people 
uh, who uh, bring their contributions, and I will say something about that, uh, because that gives us the perspective of the next generation. Um, I'm pretty sure I will not be part of the third edition of the uh, of the handbook, and also I think it should not be the case, because I think the next generation uh, already is there and is contributing. And many of the people that are in the handbook are from the next generation and uh, are already substantially contributing and even criticizing old ways of thinking about what internationalization is, and I come back to that uh, later. Uh, it is a fascinating time because uh, we are seeing a, a, a changing global landscape uh, already before the pandemic. Uh, all kinds of geopolitical developments and tensions, and of course, these days, every day on the, uh, on the agenda is the tensions between uh, Russia and uh, Europe and uh, North America uh, about Ukraine. Uh, we see tensions between China and Australia, Ch between China and uh, Europe and the United States, etc. So geopolitical developments are uh, impacting enormously the future of internationalization of higher education. We see still an increased competition with global talent. There's even much more a shortage of really talents to uh, keep the world and society ahead. We see health concerns, as the pandemic was made very clear, sustainable development and environment hold the impact of climate change. So what does it do with internationalization of higher education? Very interesting and very uh, fundamental debates about how could internet and should international education operate in being sustainable and being uh, addressing the uh, the environment uh, organizations like Kanye um, uh, are doing very interesting work on that other sustainable development goals are impacting nationalism racism etc cetera, etc cetera. so internationalization is not isolated from the rest of what is happening in higher education, but also what is happening in the world overall. And so that is uh, making our work very complex, very difficult at times, but also very important and very uh, rich of opportunities how we can shape the internationalization of the future after the momentous events of 2020. How will those who are working, and all of you who are participating in the seminar, are, respond to the challenges that we face because of this development and how will we therefore contribute to shaping the future of internationalization are the key questions that we want to address in this concluding chapter. Briefly looking back, very briefly, uh, education abroad, so all the mobility in all its forms is more driving still, uh, certainly before the pandemic, the agenda and internationalization at home, the whole internationalization curriculum, intercultural competence, etc. Mobility is still driving to a large extent, the debate about what is internationalization. There's an increasing focus on international rankings as the rules that favor some uh, more than others. Yeah? And related to that, there's a divide between the North and the South and between universities that are classified as the top world class universities and the others, which are very there. Internationalization has become over the past decades more synonym to competition and marketization than to the traditional values of cooperation, exchange, and service to society. That has been very clear a concern that already addressed in the second handbook of or the first handbook of international uh, higher education. Inequality and exclusiveness are increasing still nationally and internationally. And a, a part are saying that internationalization still is a very elitist approach. And unfortunately, we see that the current situation is making that even worse. Inequality and exclusiveness between the North and the South, inequality between those students who have access to higher education, and those not, inequality between different types of institutions, inequality is a really strong challenge that we face in internationalization. And recognition of the importance of addressing all aspects of education, the whole integrated way of comprehensive internationalization, is still very slowly taking place. Uh, many institutions claim now that they have a comprehensive internationalization strategy, but in reality, most institutions, most policies, also at the national level, are still very much driven by fragmented approaches, in particular focusing on mobility. So that's where we come from. And that, and already over the past decades, there was a strong appeal to that, but that becomes even much more important than ever, that there were increasingly in the field of international education concerns about the elitist, competitive, and market-oriented approach to internationalization, 
And for that, an urgent need for more attention to the qualitative humanistic dimensions of internationalization, including global citizen development, employability, improvement of quality of research and education, and most of all, service to society's requirement. And when we assess it, by that we have to look much more at outcomes and impact of work that we do than just purely looking at the numbers, how many students we exchange, how many students go abroad, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which we have to know and we understand as trends, but it's much more impact important what we assess as what are the qualitative impact approach what we're doing. So that is what is clearly clear on the agenda for the future. At the same time, we have to be realistic. It's not going that easy. Old habits are difficult to change. And even now we see already that several governments and institutions of higher education are going back to the way, oh, we have to recruit more international students. We have to get be competitive. We have to be focusing on increasing our position on the rankings, etc. So it is very difficult to see how we learn lessons from the future. And we as international educators, have to play a key role in convincing the leaders of our institutions, the leaders of our, of our governments, international organizations, that really it is a time fundamental to make the change and to see how we can have a social impact on developing the sustainable development goals and solve the problems that society has, even although we see that there's a trend to go back to old habits. And in that already in 2015, and that has become even more important, the, the updated definition of internationalization said that we need to be much more inclusive, less elitist. Mobility is important, but has to be a part more integrated into curriculum and teaching and learning. Internationalization is not a goal in itself but, and should not be driven by only economic rationales. And many of you are familiar with this definition, uh, so I'm not going to read it out, also given time. But we have to, even more than in 2015, where we have the update, now to say we have to have the, our intention as international education to make internationalization a process that enhance the quality of what we are doing, that is inclusive to all students and all academics, and that is making a significant contribution to the society, internationalization for higher education for society. That is what we need. And our team of young scholars said, for that reason, we identify seven key teams for an inclusive and comprehensive internationalization strategy for the future. We have to be much more focusing on inclusivity and equity in internationalization. We have to work on decolonized internationalization, looking at how internationalization has become too much a Western paradigm not understanding the needs and the, uh, the importance of the Global South, a focus on internationalization for society, forced internationalization, so focusing on refugees and immigrants as being part of internationalization. Of course, continuing emphasis on internationalization the curriculum at home, digital internationalization, the whole collaborative online international learning, virtual exchange and other models that we have been learning now during the pandemic, which get more and more important, and also to make uh, internationalization affordable for much more people by not focusing only on the small elite of students that can benefit from study abroad, but focusing on that all students have a way of how to be internationalized. That is very essential. And for that, we have to ask ourselves, and that came very clear out of that uh, uh, concluding chapter, the key questions. Who is engaged in internationalization within and beyond international institutions? Who is being left out of it? We have to understand that. What might equitable and inclusive internationalization look like? And what leadership teams, uh, leadership we need for that? How can internationalization be employed as a tool of decolonization? How can internationalization better prepare for all graduates in society to face future global challenges? and what deeper systemic changes are needed to be made. How can internationalization efforts be strengthened in order to make a more meaningful contribution to society? And what do reimagined mobility and blended mobility models look like for moving forward? What would be a more holistic approach to internationalization? And how might a digital transformation of education lead to new approaches to internationalization? These are key questions that came out of 
our contacts with the new rising stars in internationalization of higher education. And in my view, these are the questions that will shape how we are going to work in the future uh, to make internationalization really important for society and not being only an exclusive fragmented part for a small elite. That is what we want to address with our handbook. That's what we want to address with our concluding chapter. And that's what is our view, the task for our profession in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. And now we'll hear from Betty. Speaking to you from my home in Adelaide, Australia. I'm sorry I can't be physically present with you today, um, but I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to be able to put forward some ideas on the big picture of international higher education for your consideration in this webinar and hopefully beyond. The core functions of universities, teaching and learning, research and service are undoubtedly an important part of the big picture of international higher education moving forward. They're the focus of section three of the revised handbook of international higher education. This section is perhaps the most radically different section of the book from the first edition. With the title, Internationalization of Core Functions, it contains eight chapters, two that are revised versions of those in the first edition and six completely new chapters. They all contain many useful insights into how we might approach and shape the next phase of international higher education. But before I go on to share some of these ideas and insights from my perspective, I want to go back to reflect a little on Francisco Marmalejo's statement in the foreword to the book, where he says that it is necessary to revisit our rationale and assumptions about international education and to further study and understand its impact. I couldn't agree more. And I want to start here because I think it's critical that we recognize the challenges that this deceptively simple statement presents to us all, regardless of our role or our level of experience in international higher education. Revisiting our assumptions implies first being able to identify them, not an easy task in itself. And second, being willing to really challenge them, to turn them upside down and perhaps even throw them away. This is often uncomfortable because it's actually requiring that we change our habitus, the way we see the world and our work, the socially ingrained beliefs, habits, skills, and dispositions we have as a community of practice of international educators that determine our way of being international in our work. Revisiting our rationale and assumptions is a good place to start this work. I suggest we think about questions such as these. What are we trying to achieve through our involvement in international education, personally, professionally, individually, and as members of a group, including what is our moral purpose? Who else might we usefully work with to achieve our purpose, inside and outside of the university, at home and abroad? How might and should we work with these people, including students and community members? How can we think differently about their roles in international education? How else might we measure our success from the ways that we currently measure it? And not only in terms of what we set out to do, measuring our success against what we set out to do, but also in terms of its relevance to the big picture of international education. Many of the authors contributing to the handbook illustrate such rethinking in progress. Here are a few examples of ideas that I've taken away from the second edition of the handbook. If we view teaching as a moral profession, international education can be both transformed and transformational. Second idea, preparing all students for work 
life and civic engagement in a super complex globalised world is a core part of international education that starts at home. Third, learning at home for students and faculty on campus, online and in the local community is intrinsically intercultural and may be as transformational as learning abroad. Treating students and community partners and community members as equal partners in international education can have some dramatic results, but it requires that we rethink and challenge traditional power structures in international education, of which many of us are a part. Rather than assuming that faculty lack the skills or desire to engage in international education, we probably need to rethink what we mean by faculty engagement. These five ideas for me are very powerful ideas that come out of those chapters in some of the chapters in the handbook. I hope that you'll find many more ideas that are relevant to your work and will assist you to contribute to the future of international ed education. Um, when you get your copy of the handbook, or perhaps you've already started to do some of that thinking. Because in the rethinking process, whatever your role in international higher education, be it administrator, policy maker, student, student affairs professional, teacher, faculty member, researcher, community member, you're an agent of change. And you might, for example, start by assisting local communities to address international and intercultural issues in the region in ways that they have never dreamt of before. You might also learn from them about ways that you could incorporate such things into your work. Um, you might support discussions in the local community on global issues and ways in which they might be addressed through positive action on climate change. You might lead changes to policies and practices that discriminate against different national and cultural backgrounds in the university, but also in the local community. You might work with students to raise awareness of the need for a fairer and more equitable world and help them to understand how their individual actions might address global problems such as climate change and poverty. To conclude, thank you to the work of the chapter and textbox authors for their generosity in sharing their perspectives, ideas and experiences, which provide so many useful starting points for rethinking our approach to measuring the impact of our work as international educators. Thank you for listening and I hope that you really enjoy the webinar and uh, take away from it some very useful ideas. Hope to see you one day in person somewhere in the world soon. Bye for now. So many thanks to Betty Lisk for sharing her thoughts uh, with us uh, all the way from Australia and now we'll turn to Harvey Charles. Uh, to hear your thoughts um, from the based on your experience with the handbook and working with the contributors. Great, thank you very much, uh, Darla, and um, I am delighted to be here. Um, and I'm also very pleased about uh, being one of the co-editors for this very important publication, which as you all know, is a seminal publication of field of international education and actually represents the latest global thinking in the field. Um, most of my comments will be coming from the perspective of a practitioner. Uh, when I was invited to participate in this pro project, I was a practitioner. I, I am uh, a professor now, so, so less so. Um, but um, practitioners, international educators in whatever role um, are one of the chief beneficiaries of this, of this second edition um, handbook. Um, and yet uh, the, the, the reality for many of them is that they have very little time to read and, and even less time to reflect on whatever little they, uh, they might have been able to read. 
but yet in a handbook like this, we're confronted with a, a very critical question, which is how can theory inform practice? How can we apply the important uh, um, um, principles articulated in this handbook to what we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, I am very pleased that uh, Anne's and Darla and um, maybe Bet uh, Betty to a lesser extent have spoken about the, um, the, the fact that uh, student mobility um, is a dominant issue and has been for a long time. It's of course addressed in chapters 20 to 24. Um, and the fact that it uh, uh, um, takes up as many chapters speaks to its importance in the field. Um, Yet I would uh, I would suggest that we have become preoccupied with student mobility, and you know that might be understandable in light of the fact that it's very visible. It lends itself very easily to assessment, and of course, um, especially in terms of international student enrollment, it, it speaks to financial returns, something that's very very important for a number of institutions. Um, but I think, I wonder whether the time has come to shift our gaze, not to forget about student mobility by any means, but to shift our gaze because uh, the, the perils of our preoccupation with student mobility in international higher education leads us to a, a myopic and truncated view of this very important field. Um, it it, it uh, um, causes us to think maybe only in terms of providing services to students or generating tuition revenue. And it is oftentimes delinked from many other important institutional strategic concerns. It may also cloud our vision with respect to um, who, are, who are the people best suited to lead in the internationalization agenda. And frankly, it leaves very little room for other critical conversations. And of course, uh, you simply have to thumb through the second edition of the, of the handbook to see uh, the, the wide range of issues being addressed, uh, um, are currently being addressed um, under the rubric of international higher education. Um, none of us would are, are um, oblivious to the significant events that occurred in 2020 around the killing of George Floyd and um, the convocation, uh, conversations it spurred around issues of social justice. And I have to tell you that as we were writing this book, um, coming towards the end, we realized that we could not complete this book and not try to address um, issues of the pandemic, issues of social justice and so on. And so we went back to um, all of the authors and asked them to, to try to address those issues as much as possible. So um, when, you, when you look at the handbook, when you read the chapters, you would realize that many of them address issues of social, social justice. Um, unfortunately, in my estimation, I believe that international higher education has not sufficiently engaged with this issue, and it's a belated engagement, if you will, on the issue of social justice. Social justice has global implications, um, as we saw in, in, in the response to the George Floyd killings, there were protests all over the world, it was not only an American issue. Um, the reality is that it needs to be of, a con of concern to us as international educators as well. And to the extent that we choose to engage in this work, and I believe we must, um, it must go beyond rhetorical commitment because it requires active work to dismantle structural inequality. Um, Ibrahim X. Kindi, who has written quite a bit about anti-racism, has made it quite clear um, that there is no middle ground we are either racist or we are anti-racist. And if we are anti-racist, we're actively engaged in dismantling the structures of racism in our society. And this, of course, this principle um, applies much broadly beyond racism to issues of social justice. And so it's incumbent on us to find ways to resist the superficial or the performative and move to trying to use social justice as an organizing principle in building capacity for internationalization on our campuses and in trying to advance this important work. The other issue I'd like to turn your attention to, um, again, mentioned earlier by, by Hans, is the um, decolonizing international, internationalization. And um, this is addressed 
um, in the conclusion section by um, a number of young contributors, um, emerging leaders in the field. Um, and it's important for us to address this issue because there is and continues to be a legacy of colonization within higher education. And the question then becomes, and this is one of the questions posed at the end of uh, Hans's presentation, how can we leverage internationalization to um, engage in decolonization work, if you will? And I believe that as international educators, we can do so by calling out colonial violence underwriting modern lives and livelihoods as to the extent that it manifests itself in, in the institutions with which we are affiliated. Um, we can challenge um, Western epistemic supremacy. We can welcome indigenous knowledge and non-modern systems of thought. Um, we can actively engage in dismantling structural inequities and confronting the commodification of experiences and resources. We can work to obstruct predatory, extractive, and exploited, exploitative relationships. Um, and we can actually try to do work that aims to empower those who have previously been marginalized. I, I couldn't help myself uh, when I encountered this uh, reference um, that this uh, uh, statement made by Sharon Stein, who is one of the contributors, and she asked a question. Why has the feel of internationalization uh, largely, um, I'm sorry, largely denied the existence or at least the magnitude of these problems? And she answers by saying, perhaps it is because doing so enables us to uh, continue uh, to enjoy the shiny promises that are offered by our existing systems and institutions. So what she's speaking here too is the notion of complicity. And, 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 and that involves all of us and we have to be honest and willing to confront that about ourselves and our practices if we are truly committed to finding ways to um, decolonize internationalization. Some of the sites where this work can be done, certainly education abroad, um, but also in international student recruitment and enrollment, in research, in curriculum internationalization, in international partnerships and collaborations, and even in the around the issues of global rankings. I also believe as a practitioner that it is really important for us to think of ourselves, not only as people who deliver services, but fundamentally as educators. We are much more than bureaucrats. And yes, that's part of our role. There is no question. We work within institutions and we shuffle papers all day long, but we're also fundamentally educators. And we need to see our role as having a lot to do with trying to impact the pillars of the academy, teaching, research, uh, service. And in this regard, I like to talk about thinking about curriculum internationalization as being core to our work. And we have to be careful when we talk about this because we're not as uh, practitioners necessarily in the classrooms per se. Yes, some of us are, I'm a professor and there, there are dozens, hundreds of other professors of international education, but, but those who are senior international officers or directors or executive directors, um, there are ways in which we can contribute to this agenda. And, and this is actually uh, addressed in chapter 13 of the handbook um, by Betty Leask and Elizabeth Brewer. Um, and uh, so take a read uh, and uh, to the extent that you have not considered this or looked at this before um, and, and work to begin to see this as part of your commitment and your agenda because the uh, curriculum internationalization is key to preparing globally competent graduates. It is key to advancing a sustainable world. It is key to fostering peace and security for all. And so we need to see ourselves as an advocate, um, as a supporter, um, strategizing with faculty and other administrators to make this work possible and trying to enable this work as much as we can using resources. Um, I worked at an institution once upon a time where I had a fairly large budget and I was able to use some of this to support faculty in engaging in this kind of work. So as we look ahead, 
It's important that we listen to the voices of young emerging leaders in the field. Um, and of course, they are featured um, uh, prominently in the conclusion section of the handbook. Uh, we need to um, uh, address issues of inclusi inclusiveness and equity. Uh, internationalization is a force for good, digital internationalization, and transformative internationalization. And I think I'd leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harvey, for sharing your thoughts on this. And um, we wanted to, to turn now to questions that, that you all as, as the audience might have. Again, a huge thanks to, to Hans and Betty and, and Harvey for sharing thoughts from the handbook. Um, and one of the questions that we have um, for you is, and it's uh, something you alluded to initially, Hans, is that even since, this uh, this handbook was updated in, in, and submitted for publication early in the pandemic. A lot has happened since then. So to both of you, as you look to the future, uh, what are some other changes that, that uh, maybe weren't addressed in the handbook as it stands now? What do you see as we look to hopefully a post-pandemic future in regards to internationalization of higher education? Yeah, if I can start, uh, I, I think more important is not so much what what has been added, but, but what has been re-emphasized by uh, the pandemic and the, the current situation. Uh, all the issues that uh, are now so clearly the forefront were already there before. Uh, the decolonization debate, the focus much more from uh, mobility to internationalization of the curriculum was already there, was a movement already for decades. Uh, but now has become much more clear. Uh, digital internationalization, COIL was already there for a long time, but it was still marginal, now suddenly becomes to the forefront. Uh, the uh, whole internationalization for society, of course, we always assumed that it was, but it didn't really happen. And now it has become so much clear that if we really want to solve the problems, then it has to be at the forefront. Uh, that we cannot be mobile, but have to look into different ways how we can interact. Uh, that uh, uh, we have to look at what does it mean, as, as, as also Harvey said uh, at the end, uh, what does it mean for study abroad? What does it mean for, uh, for mobility of faculty? Uh, what does it mean for organizations like AIEA with their huge conferences, NAFSA and EIE and others? Uh, can, we, can we really be sustainable when we do that? Can we? Uh, we have to do what we preach. And so we also have to look as organizations and as individuals in this field, looking into it, can we do things differently? Of course, mobility is a very important part. I will not say it's not the case. And it might be looking a luxury that uh, people who are over 70 like me have had the opportunity and never had to worry about that issue because it was not an issue, at least it was an issue, but we didn't recognize it as an issue. And now we say to younger people, well, you should be much more careful about taking a plane, et cetera. But the reality is we have to do that. And, we, and, the, and the good thing is many things we can do. We can have this kind of webinars, which are much more effective in reaching out to people than if we would have done that at a, a, a place and we, people had to be mobile, et cetera. Uh, so many things can be done and we have to do that and we have to become much more aware of it. That's, I think, the most important lesson that we have learned from the pandemic uh, we need to change, but we also can change if we really want to do it. And that's uh, what I think is the, the essential uh, lesson. But Harvey, maybe you have to add to that. I guess one of the things I would add is that um, in some ways we are in the midst of fairly profound changes and we're not entirely sure. It's almost as if we're going through a, a, a tunnel and we might be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, but we're not entirely sure what things would be like on the other end. I happen to think that this provides all of us an opportunity to weigh in on the conversation about what the academy, for example, will look like um, as a result of these uh, fairly um, substantial uh, impacts that we've witnessed. Um, the pandemic, issues around social justice, and even the economic uh, um, 
the significant Im economic impacts that we have, uh, we that many people, maybe not so much in um, Western industrialized nations, but in the rest of the world, in most of the rest of the world that have been uh, really hammered by um, the, the economic uh, fallout of this, uh, of the past two years. Um, all of these forces and factors are impacting the shape of what the academy will become. And this, in my estimation, provides us with an opening to try to contribute to this conversation as to uh, what the academy would look like um, and uh, what kind of space will open up and, and the extent to which we can create even more space for um, internationalization and values around internationalization to emerge and to go to the center as opposed to um, being on the margins. Um, one of the realities about uh, um, the field is that because of the newness of the field, we've been marginal on many campuses for um, much, of, much of our lives, much of our history. Um, and so the question becomes, will this period of transformation help to move internationalization closer to the center? I contend that as international educators, we can raise our voices and we can um, make the case as compellingly as we can. And in fact, in many ways, the crisis provides um, a lot of uh, um, um, justifications, if you will, uh, for moving internationalization closer, closer to the center so that um, uh, we can influence this conversation going forward. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts uh, as we look to the future. We have a lot of questions coming in and I know we don't have uh, a lot of time left, but let's see if we can get to some of these. So um, you spoke about the values piece and, and looking at kind of what role do values play in this? It does seem like this is, if there's a silver lining in all of what's been happening the last couple of years is it really has, uh, as Hans said, clarified and Harvey, as you so articulately spoke as well around the, the role of social justice uh, in, in internationalization and really bringing in those diversity, the values of diversity, equity, inclusion, justice into the work that we're doing. What role do you see as the, the values have uh, in, in our work in internationalization? And uh, along with that, um, how, what would you say about the need to decolonize the professional pipeline within that? Yeah, I mean, values are indeed very important. And to, to a large extent, I think uh, we have ignored that for several decades. I mean, the, the original definition, which was widely accepted by Jay Knight, was a, a working definition. So we defined internationalization as a process uh, but we didn't put any normative values to it uh, because we thought that that was by nature happening. Uh, the reality was that that definition could be used for by uh, Australians to recruit international students for revenue generation and for others, by the way, as well. I'm not, not excusing only uh, uh, Australians to that. Uh, it could be used for internationalization curriculum. It could be used for everything. But it didn't, uh, didn't emphasize our values. So that's why in 2015, based on an, uh, a Delphi exercise, we said, well, we have to be a little bit more normative if we want to define what is important for the future. And I think that's what is happening in the current debate. And that's why it is so important that people like Sean Stein and many others who have been contributing to this uh, chapter and who are publishing ac actively about decolonization are doing that. Uh, I, I mean, I have been working always in the international environment, uh, even the books that I wrote in the 90s were with uh, authors from uh, Latin America, from Africa and Asia. But still, it was true that the discourse, even then by people like Jay Knight and I, was from a Western paradigm, and we included the others. There was already a change to much what happened before, but making them much more the leading voice is so important. Uh, and understanding them and collaborating between them. So uh, indeed, decolonizing the, the, the faculty pipeline is also important. Uh, at the same time, we have still we are still in a very early debate about what that means. And so there's much more research to be done. There's much more collaboration to be done. There should be much more South-South cooperation huh? because we can say it's a Western paradigm. But at the same time, we see still a lot of scholars and international educators in the South 
copying what is happening in the, in, in the north, uh, not thinking about can we define internationalization our own way. And that is so important because that challenges our paradigm. Uh, we can challenge it ourselves and we have to do that, but it's much more important that we are challenged by uh, people who come with a different perspective. And that's uh, what I think is uh, uh, what's so important and so great to see that all those new scholars from also the Global South, in particular from the Global South, are uh, challenging us. Uh, and ha we have to be challenged much more than ever before, because that only makes us uh, ready for the, for the future. And in that values have to be defined values sometimes are seen as western values but i think they are we have to define what are general values and the whole debate about for instance academic freedom uh, is now perceived as a western one but at the same time i think it's still a general one and but then you have to see well well how do people in the global south look at it and what can we do to make it a general value etc so it's important we have to be careful that we are not getting to a kind of vogue uh, debate about what is good and what is bad, but what we can do together to make things change in a positive way. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and that um, has absolutely the, the importance of really um, seeking out those different perspectives and, and being very aware of, of how we're viewing the world and moving beyond the traditional paradigms that we've always used in, in terms of looking at internationalization. And hopefully the handbook and the contributors in the handbook help push uh, readers to, to move beyond uh, what we typically think, particularly as, as you've heard from the last chapter, as we listen to the newer voices in challenging us to rethink internationalization, as Betty said. So we are almost at time, and we want to thank all of you for your questions and your comments in chat. If you did not get your question um, answered today, you'll have two more opportunities in March, in March 2nd and 9, uh, for the next two installments um, in this webinar series based Based on uh, the contributions uh, to this uh, second edition of the handbook. Uh, we want to thank all of you all for being part of today, especially to thank our editorial team for sharing their initial thoughts on the big picture. As we think about the big picture, um, it, it really seems like it's so important for all of us to strive toward intentional internationalization of higher education that is inclusive, just, equitable, and relevant within uh, the current realities and complexities in which we live, that we challenge the assumptions that we've made around internationalization, that we don't remain uh, complacent and complicit with what has been, and, and we move and be ready and willing to change our thinking and our action around internationalization of higher education, including the dismantling of systemic and structural racism and challenging Western epistemologies with our, within our own contexts. And uh, as kind of Harvey said, we, we need to embrace our role as educators first, as we prepare globally competent students to be active citizens in addressing the challenges of, of our societies today. So again, we, uh, we hope that this second edition of the handbook will be useful to you in your context. We thank you again for being part of today's webinar. A huge thanks to all of our contributors to the handbook. For, uh, and to AIEA and to Silas for publishing the second edition. Thank you again, everyone. Hello, everyone. And thank you to our editors for sharing their time and presenting with us today. And thank you to everyone who tuned in live with us this afternoon on Zoom. If you are interested in ordering the second edition of the Handbook of International Higher Education, use code IND25 to get 25% off the book and free shipping from Stylus. I will share the link and code in the chat bar. Registration for the March 2nd and March 9th International Higher Ed webinars is now open and those links will be in the chat bar as well. The webinar video replay and transcript will be available by this Friday and shared on all of our stylist social media networks. If you have any feedback on this webinar or any requests for future webinars, please feel free to email us directly at stylusinfo at styluspub.com. Thank you again to AIEA for co-hosting this webinar series and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.